Um, thanks everyone for sticking around late. Uh, I've been on uh, maybe five days of planes in the last six, so I uh, share your fatigue, um, but I'll make this quick. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ilya for uh, putting me on the roster last minute, um, Amazon for funding my travel, and uh, uh, UCSD, and specifically the Division of Biomedical Informatics and their training grant from the NIH for funding my research. Um, this kind of ties in nicely with uh, Ilya's uh, talk about distributed uh, algorithms for sparse data. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, is not really distributed algorithms, but how we can work with seemingly large uh, sparse data on a single machine, even when maybe uh, naively the dimensionality would seem to make that impossible. Um, yeah. Um, so my work's motivated uh, by an interest in multi-label classification. So uh, there's a lot of tasks. Uh, in this case, uh, I, I started thinking about this while working on a task where we were trying to predict uh, tens of thousands of features from hundreds of thousands, uh, or tens of thousands of labels from hundreds of thousands of features. Um, in that case, even uh, making a single dense update might take seconds. Uh, and so getting through a data set of uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of examples uh, would seem impossible. But on, uh, in cases like when you have a bag of words, um, actually, uh, the data is quite sparse. So generally, multi-label classification, we've got uh, our, our point is uh, you know, a vector in some Rn. We want to predict a set of labels, not just uh, which don't have to be mutually exclusive. So you could say that uh, it's a more general case than multi-class classification. Uh, and a lot of real-world tasks are uh, multi-label. You know, we could just cobble together any number of uh, tasks we have for the same data set, sort of, as line, and just say, now, now it's a multi-label task. Um, um, and, you know, still today, and, and this is changing a bit, and I'll be on the deep learning panel so we could talk more about learning shared representations, but still today, if you look at competition winners, uh, very often the winners, uh, the best methods for uh, mu large-scale multi-label problems are binary relevance. Uh, binary relevance is basically when you uh, train a separate binary class for, it, for, uh, for every single label. Um, so, and, and often, you know, when we're talking about auto-tagging tasks, like working with web data or, you know, uh, uh, in my case, like tagging documents in the biomedical literature, uh, you know, every document might contain 200 words, but they might be from a very large vocabulary. When I was working with uh, medical data, you know, you have every name of every gene, every name of every disease, every name of every protein. These are all important vocabulary words that you don't want to throw away. Um, another problem uh, that you encounter when it's multi-label is that uh, the predictive features for, for one label might not be the same as the predictive features for another. So if you want to train uh, locally, you know, just uh, coming up with an idea of just, I'm going to throw out some features doesn't always work because uh, many of your labels are rare and uh, many of the features that are predictive of your rare labels are themselves rare. Uh, and that's also a problem with, uh, you know, unsupervised dimensionality reduction of this kind of data. It's that you, uh, you lose the, uh, I call it the platypus problem, because the predictive word for the label platypus is platypus, and both the word and the label occur one in 200,000 times, you know, ma articles maybe at most, uh, maybe even rare in the biomedical literature. Uh, so, you know, what I'm talking about now is uh, a simple trick that we came up with, you know, or uh, an extension to a known trick, really, um, for, for sort of getting uh, the effects of sparsity for free. We want to train algorithms that uh, scale only in the number of non-zero features, not in the total sort of nominal dimensionality, because even though our data set uh, appears to be really large, if we just look at the size of uh, the matrix, it's actually uh, quite small if we look at the uh, information content, or comparatively small. So, you know, we want to scale only in the, if we assume the, the green circles are, are the non-zero features. Um, and so it's easy to get sparsity for free, uh, absent regularization, because you train with stochastic gradient descent, and the gradient is, uh, is sparse wherever the features are sparse. The gradient is zero with respect to a feature that's not there. Uh, the problem is that when you add regularization, it destroys the sparsity of the gradient. And so, um, you know, then you know you're back stuck in the uh, the ugly dense case. So uh, again, and, and uh, you know we're interested in regularization now uh, for two reasons. One is because we don't want to overfit, 
uh, in that sense, you know, we want to increase performance. So, you know, for that, uh, L2 regularization is, you know, widely considered to have, uh, you know, as compared to L1, superior performance. But we're also interested in uh, regularization because we want to reduce the model size. If we have many, many labels and many, many features, then it might not be possible to actually store even the models uh, on a single machine for, you know, just binary relevance. So uh, we're interested in elastic net, which is a popular method in practice because it combines uh, the sort of sparsifying effects of L1 and the better performance of L2. And empirically, often, people are able to sort of get uh, sort of both effects uh, without losing that much in the trade-off. Um, so what we do is we use a, a lazy updating scheme. And this was first described by uh, uh, Bob Carpenter in 2008. It was also described, uh, discovered, I believe, independently by John Langford. And there's another paper by John Ducci and uh, Yoram Singer. And, and basically the idea, uh, which has been described previously you know, for L1 regularization and for uh, uh, the infinity norm, is that what we want to do is, you know, yeah, there's a regularization update whenever a feature is not there, provided that the, the weight is non-zero. But that update depends only on the, the size of, uh, of the weight. It doesn't depend upon the example. The regularization update when the feature is zero. Uh, uh, so what we could do is actually, if we can come up with a closed form to sort of lazily apply uh, very many regularization updates all at once, then we sort of can just uh, only pay attention to the non-zero features, and then we, uh, we, we apply this uh, lazy sort of bulk update, and uh, update um, sort of in constant time, apply all the regularization updates. Um, so what we did is we, we derived uh, an extension of this previous work, which had shown the uh, regularization for uh, L1, and um, are able to extend it to elastic net, um, and in including the case of a varying learning rate over time. Um, so can't really get too deep into the derivation or the mathematics, as uh, Ilya's informed me. I have precisely one minute. And uh, I guess I'll be speaking to you again in the deep learning panel. So uh, just showing you some very quick results before we end. Um, we trained you know, here just for reproducibility on the two largest uh, sets in the Mulan repository, which is a repository of multi-label data sets. Uh, one of them has 50,000 features. Uh, the other has, I believe, about 2,000 features on the order of 100,000 examples. And we show that on a single laptop, on a single core, uh, we're able to train with this model, which is effectively uh, you know, training. One has 200 labels, one has 100 labels, in, uh, you know, to convergence on the order of you know, 10, 15 minutes. So anyway, uh, that's my talk. I imagine we probably don't have time for questions, but uh, if you're interested in the work, you can come by the uh, poster session.